Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Quest for the Bestest. It's the podcast from Backlot Badger where we review every single Palm d'Or winner in random order. That's right. We are talking about the Cannes Film Festival. And today we are reviewing a film from 2013, a film rated rather up there on the rating scale, not audience appreciation, but MPAA rating NC-17. Uh, <laughs> Blue oh. is the Warmest Color is the film that we're talking about today. Uh, directed by Abdelatif Kashiche. This is a, a a French movie, and I think there's a lot of elements of this movie that are pretty French. We are going to discuss all of that and more when we get into Language. it. But first, first, of course, the housekeeping. I just want to bang this all out so we can talk about the movie. Last time, we discussed Dumbo, Walt Disney's 1941 film, which appeared in the 1947 edition of the Cannes Film Festival. We thought... It was uh, uh, actually kind of interesting to discuss, but not super highly rated on the list. We gave it a 5.6, which puts it at spot number 15. But if you're interested to hear our one and only episode about animation, I would go check that out because there's just none others in the slate. Maybe, unless maybe next year. I don't know. We can hold out hope that the Academy <laughs> will nominate a uh, an animated film for Best Picture next year. The However, Garfield movie. Let's just come out and say it. The Garfield movie. The it's going to be nominated movie. for Best Picture. <laughs> Let's just come out and say it. Could win. And could win. In contention. Well, I am curious to hear from our audience because before we talk about Blue is the Warmest Color, we do need to hear their thoughts over the last two weeks or so we've been out, uh, not been able to record. Abram, do you have a comment for us? I do. I have a comment from my review of A Man and a Woman. Uh, this comes from Vero Ave 3, uh, who said, this is one of the greatest films of French cinema uh, in 1966. Now, that seems a little bit niche. Okay, we're, we're, we're whittling down our criteria, yeah. <laughs> However, uh, they, they continue with some interesting insight here by saying, uh, the tracking shot uh, in the train station at the end had never been done before. Uh, the music score and two of the greatest actors at that time were featured as well. Hmm. Uh, is a must watch. Mm. We must watch it. Yes. I don't dis- I don't disagree with any of that. I don't disagree with any of that. I actually just want to do a quick double feature here. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. because we did we did also get a comment here on the Dumbo review yeah. that Timo. And, and I think we do need to read that out because it's rare that we get a comment on our most recent episode that we get to read out. That, that's subscribe. true. I, I, this this comes from someone named the cat indeed who says oh. the following here, and, and and this is really Timo. I'd like your response. Okay. Uh, be careful what you say about animation, Timo. You might just get picked to present the best animated feature at the Oscars next year. <laughs> well, what what happened at the animated presenting? Do you, does anyone remember? It seems like they're referencing a, something that happened. Oh, I don't think I don't think they are. Oh, All right. they're just putting my name in the hat, which I appreciate. Right off, right off yeah. Well, that that would be very exciting if Timo got to present an Oscar. Yeah. But, Timo we'll is the most industry adjacent of any of us. Oh, he, he has won an industry yeah. award. That's I'm going to be pulling on my strings and working my way up to that stage in February yeah. or whenever they have the ceremony. <laughs> yes. That's right. It's never in February. It's in March it's now. It's in yeah. it's been February once or twice. What, in the 40s? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Let's talk about the movie. Let's sure. talk about Blue is the Warmest Caller. Tanner, since you have now changed seating positions, do us the honor and... Uh, well, we should have flipped who reads the comment and who gives the synopsis, but whatever, Tanner. Yeah, it's what really about the, the chair, <laughs> That's not true. the person. Mm-hmm. I would, I could never, you know, delve into the the hellish depths of the YouTube comments. No. I would never <laughs> ever do that. You could never open up the YouTube Studio app and read the top thing at it. Uh, <laughs> you could never do that. It takes a pretty steady hand. All right, look at my look at my hands, all shaky, all all over the goddamn place. All right, the plot of Blue is the Warmest Color. So this is a film. That is adapted from a graphic novel. What? Oh, really? Really, really. Um, one of the first times we've ever... It's like uh, Kick-Ass. I think... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure the novel is very similar to Kick-Ass. Anyway, this is a film that follows a young girl uh, named Adele who is in high school, or whatever they call it over there, across the, across the way in France. Gymnasium high school in French. Like that. That's right. She is, she, she is sort of um, coming into her own... Uh, She is aging, she was maturing, and she feels sort of alienated from the rest of her classmates. She doesn't really fit in, she doesn't really understand why. Um, There's obviously, as as there is in high school, a lot of talk of sex and who you're having sex with and who you want to have sex with. And Adele sort of like uh, falls into these pressures. She starts seeing a boy named Thomas and finds finds herself not romantically fulfilled by him. 
And Vax feels uh, not romantically fulfilled at all until she eventually meets a older woman named Emma. Uh, Emma is a college student and they d develop a relationship. Um, and eventually, as the film uh, spans probably, what, five, ten years, something like that? Yeah, there's mm -hmm. an undisclosed amount of time. Yeah. Three they, hours um, of you know, Redacted. Life. Yeah. They uh, <laughs> yes. they do they, they develop a, a quite the intimate relationship, then eventually do have a falling out, and um, Adele ends up, I guess, at the end of the film, well, I mean, we'll talk about this, but having to forge her own path instead of, you know, being, I guess, sort of operating as part of a uh, a symbiotic symbiotic relationship with with Emma, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and and then really that's what most symbiotic relationships, even the ones in nature, they should do. Like you know, there's the anemones and like the clownfish. I say, leave the anemones behind, clownfish. Forge yeah. your own path. That's right. Forward. Just walk on down the street of whatever <laughs> French village you may find yourself in, and you know, just just wander off into the sunset. Yeah, great advice. What do you guys think of I the I think film? those little birds should abandon the hippos. Now oh, clean. no. We're going to get the teeth those, clean. Those <laughs> Abram, what did you think of Blue is the Warmest Color? I did not like Blue is the Warmest Color oh, almost my. at all. Um, I, I, I find this film to be really perplexing in a lot of ways. Mm. I, I really do not know what to make of the character arcs of our main characters. I do not know what to make about the uh, extremely gratuitous sex. I think that there is a dark cloud put over the entire film by what Tanner, I'm sure you'll elaborate on, yeah, is the yes. pretty um, poor, uh, pretty abusive uh, onset experience of our lead actresses. Um, and I think that the whole thing just feels kind of icky. Mm, sure. I, I think that there are moments of really intense um, emotion, especially in the third act of the film. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just ultimately find that this re relationship seems to just be predicated on what the director is interested in showing and, uh -huh. and, and really nothing else. Um, I think that the performances are great, but I, it's kind of all I have here. I really didn't like this one. Um, yeah, go. I mean, I feel in a uh, in a similar vein, though I would say on the whole, I did enjoy and quite like Blue is the Warmest Color, um, but it's perhaps the most complex uh, set of thoughts that I have about a film that we've discussed here um, because of these surrounding circumstances. But I think, you know, as Abram mentioned, there's a, there's a number of scenes and circumstances and character relationships where you can't exactly ignore that, and it comes to bear on screen. It's not something that you need to read an article beforehand or afterwards to sort of pick up the vibe on. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about that, but um, just to echo some things that Abram said, yes, I do find the performances to be quite astounding. I think those are obviously uh, the the large, big, strong suit of this film, probably what will make it last in my memory the most. Um, I found the writing, you know, this is an adaptation of a graphic novel, but if it comes up, I can sort of I looked into it and how it departs uh, from the the source material. Um, so the writing I found to be quite uh, the you know the, these dialogue scenes or the thematic material is quite moving and uh, thought provoking as well. So I was really dialed in for the entire three hour runtime of Blue is the Warmest Color. Doesn't feel like that really flew by for me. Um, and but do do have these these complex thoughts about it that I want to that I want to share with you guys. Mm hmm. I find my thoughts are not particularly complex, and I want to try to tease out why, uh, is that I love this movie. This is one of my favorite Palm Door winners we've seen, and it's for one key reason. Adele Exarchopoulos is maybe like my one of my top three favorite lead actress performances I've ever seen in my yeah, life. I think, yeah. it's, I think it's one of the most impressive, varied performances I've ever seen. And you give me a character that is likable, that is be given a very good performance by, by a lead uh, actor, actress, and they go through a bunch of stuff. I'm in, baby. That, and that's it. I was just there for Adele's ups and downs of her life and her relationships and discovering who she was. And yeah, the movie gets dark and it gets weird and gets complex. And of course, there are other things behind it. But it was a three-hour French movie about a love story. And you you tell me that at the top. I'm like, oh, boy. All <laughs> right. We'll see where this goes. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I'm introduced to Adele as a character and see the excellent performance and I think the excellent dialogue that is given and I think the very compelling romance and the way that it um, tackles romance being a complex thing and how that can change over time, 
um, with a relationship, I, I was all the way in. And this is one of my like top like four or five favorite films we've seen for the show. Or for, yeah. for the Palm Door version of the show. I pretty much think this film is a swing and a miss. I didn't particularly enjoy it. I was pretty tapped out while watching it. Um, I think that a number of things that you guys say I actually disagree with. I hate to be like this at the top of the review, but I really did Boy. not like Adele nor did I oh, find wow. her performance to be very affecting. I just, Ooh. I don't actually, I'm not going to rag on Adele Exarchopoulos as a performer because I actually, I, I, morally I'm not okay with that, but I just was not ingratiated to her character or found myself like rooting for her or, or finding any re redeeming moments, even though I think she's a very sympathetic character. Um, I found myself frustrated by the filmmaking style of this uh, thing. It was going <laughs> for a very specific effect, and yes, it just we'll talk about that. It just it just pissed me off. Um, and I I believe that there are moments of brilliance in this film, and yet the sum of its parts is is much worse than mm. it, the parts. The it like some scenes really 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 stick in my mind and are just like great great dialogue, super realistic. And other ones where I'm like, like, I just I really can't get over the sex in this movie. Like, it's mm. so weird, but also like pornographic. It's it, it takes a straddle between making you feel really uncomfortable for the purpose of making you feel really uncomfortable. But then it uses filmmaking's ability to play both sides of that pendulum. And it, I, I believe it's really trying to make you feel like what these characters are feeling, which is very intense and passionate and all that. But just leaves me feeling very, very icky and, and really not what I'm trying to watch the movie for. I think that mm -hmm. there are ways to kind of get around this. And, and, and you know, this movie is a great example to or to 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 crack that can of worms open about sex scenes in films mm -hmm. and to see where yeah. that line is. Um, this one's for you, Phil. <laughs> and I think that it unfortunately... I would say this, this film is not for him. No, for him. God. <laughs> this movie crosses that line despite... Uh, having good moments and and Leah Sado I think is is really excellent. Um, but yeah, it just didn't do it for me. Is it it's you know I find myself having complex, complicated thoughts and and relaying the stuff that's going on in the film to my own life and my own experience. And those are all good marks, but I just didn't enjoy it. I just didn't want to watch it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I I think we should start with the sex because I think that okay. is yeah. what this movie is known for both in its production history and the abusive uh, nature behind that which we'll get into but also just in terms of this i think easily and far away being the most explicit nudity and sexual encounter i've ever seen in a theatrically released film that received critical acclaim um i will say out at the top that of yeah there the, the sex scenes i think there's like three of them or something Ooh, they're they're very long they're very explicit um but there's there was less of it than i thought there would be um and so interestingly enough barely factors into my thought process of the film I'm not watching it for the sex i'm watching it for the characters i'm watching it for the performances of course they have a sexual relationship and it's important i think to portray that but I, I, tanner and i just kind of like joked to them because it was like what the fuck else are we gonna do like we're sitting there we're watching well, this go on I and we're like that's the problem i think that's exactly the problem <laughs> yeah but yeah. but i'm just saying in what i'm thinking about this film is like we just kind of like, you know, talked a little bit while it was happening and then it moved on. And I got to get back to the stuff I was, you know, excited to see, which was a, a yeah. complicated life of a young French woman. So they, they they're uh, they're obviously a big part of this film, but certainly don't weigh heavy in my mind. Sure. I mean, I, I, I feel I feel the opposite. I think those are the, the moments in the film that most heavily persuade me. Uh, or dissuade me rather from saying that this is this could you know, this could have been like a, a really like fantastic standout film in my mind, and those are the moments that really I have to factor in the film as a whole and say these are a large part that uh, have drawn have drawn a lot of controversy, yeah. and the director has spoken out about this, and the stars have spoken out about it um, in particular, and I don't know they, they they do have to weigh heavily on my opinion of the film nonetheless. Tanner, can you give it just a little bit of context? Sure, yes. benefit me. On okay, this. so uh, I did I did somewhat speak out of turn at the end of the last episode. So there's never been specific complaints or accusations sure. made to Kashish about the sex scenes in this film. Um, Exarchopolis and Saidu have both spoken, you know, in the immediate uh, after the immediate release of this film and like. Sadu gave, gave, gave a um, 
a interview like last year where she went over this uh, again, sort of reiterating how it wasn't just the sex scenes. The entire film was sort of, you know, mar- mired in this whole she was very controlling. She uh, yeah. she she doesn't exactly um, use you know soft words around. She <laughs> she says he, he's he's crazy. He's intense. He was he was you know trying to divide me and Adele and make us hate each other mm. on set, presumably for like effect in the film character character Maybe, effect yeah. in the film. Um, and it, it, she, she basically said I would never work with him again. Not in, not in a million years. Yeah. Um, oh, and he's not a particularly relevant director anymore, no. so it seems like um, that. Kashish himself was accused of sexual assault by a different anonymous actress mm. uh, in 2018, so there is that to consider as well. Um, but they, yeah, so basically Sidhu and Exarchopolis have said it was not specifically the sex scenes, but it also wasn't not the sex scenes that yeah, were an yeah, issue yeah. in the production in, of this film. In, in my mind, they're gratuitous, right? I think that yeah, totally. they are... They are very foundational to our character. And and honestly, we need to see Adele's face while she's having sex. We need to see what is going on in her mind in this moment, because I think a large part of the first half of the film is about this sexual awakening of hers and, and, and the realization uh, of her queerness and how she is feels so out of place with this and how the her her, her schoolmates treat her. Um, yeah. The, the satisfaction and dissatisfaction with mm, the different ones. Yeah, and different I, encounters she has. Yeah, the the like we it's it's kind of a planting and payoff writing scheme. Like you need to set up the bad sex before you can make the character <laughs> relieved and get to the good sex. Like that needs to be there plot wise. But I think that our filmmaking, the the photography of it, the editing of it, it goes on too long. Um, the lack of editing. <laughs> well, yeah, and we kind of, yeah. Well, I mean, just the cuts between. I was like, I was sitting there being like, so what's the difference between between this and porn? And I was like, well, porn usually doesn't ellipse any time. You, you see the whole thing, but yeah. this we are ellipsing a lot <laughs> this, of time. This, we, and, yeah, and this there, is something there that I have um, conceived yeah. my def my clear my the difference You've between porn and cinema. I have conceived. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, very good. Um, um, no, this is so it's just oh, sorry, too much. Too it's just too much, even though. I think we could be smarter and more efficient and 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 a bit more respectful. Maybe I don't like yeah. that the characters are canonically underage when we first start seeing them naked, but it is kind of how they are supposed Technically, to be. Technically, so. the we, age of consent in France is fifteen. So legally, in France, it is not in a legal relationship. The context of us as Americans uh-huh. paints that in a different light. But knowing the production realities and culture of yeah. France. It's not that it isn't uncomfortable, but it is not illegal. See, I don't agree with that, though. because It's, it's literally not illegal. That's no, a fact. No, no, it's sorry. a legal fact. What, what I don't agree with is the idea that it's not weird in the context of the film. No, I because, think it is. Because, I, I said it was. Sure. Oh, sorry. I might have misunderstood you. Yeah. My, my point is they draw explicit attention in their first meeting at the bar to the fact that she is underage mm-hmm. yes, in the yes, context totally. of drinking. Now, yeah. as you're saying, not in the context of giving consent, but yeah. there is there is this clear imbalance in the characters Absolutely. that I think is never properly addressed by the film because it doesn't care to. Yeah. And I think that mm. this is one of my big problems with the movie, especially by the time that Adele is sort of uh, shoot up and spit out of the relationship. Yeah. I find what we're supposed to derive about her character to be almost inscrutable. And I want to get into that. But I think sure. that the sex scene, there's one particular sex scene that goes on so long it becomes comedic. Yes. It's, a, and it's the, the first major one between between Emma and Adele. Yeah, and I and I just think that you I watch it through the through the lens of the director's pleasure. And the male gaze is something very often talked about in cinema mm-hmm. in general, but particularly in cinema like this, of course. And I think that just the gratuitous duration of the sex scenes does not add much to me or it really suggest a, a sort of character moment uh, mm. on the whole i mean sure. I, I, an example i was thinking about is earlier this year love lies bleeding came out mm-hmm. yeah. love lies bleeding is a phenomenal movie and there's a lot of really hot sex scenes in that movie mm-hmm. but they are about the characters relationship together and the dialogue they exchange and what yeah. that says about them together at that moment but there's basically I, no dialogue in any of these sex scenes. no and i and i understand that from a certain uh point of view but I, at the same time, as I'm watching this as an audience member, I'm saying, to me, the lack of information that we're gaining about our characters, our characters are gaining about each other, makes me just look at this as a as a sort of 
fetishized depiction yeah, totally. of of lesbian sex that the director wanted to make. Yeah. And and I think that yeah, when you yeah there's a little bit of a supporting evidence. The male gaze, I think, is a really great thing to bring up here because there is a repeated shot in this film that happens three or four times in which Adele's character is laying like face down, tummy down on a bed or something, and the camera always conspicuously head behind ass is got just cheeks, yeah. just like very prominently in frame, very much on a butt in this to, movie. Yeah, it's to be looked at. It's not. Yeah. And and why says what? Uh, it's 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 it is fetishistic in a in a in a gross way, and it's the problem is is that it's done through the the angle of the lens, and it's done through this like the way the film is constructed, less like like filmically image and and framing and stuff than I think story wise, because I think story wise there is, mm -hmm. I mean it's it is a, a romance, and it's about the the trials and tribulations of that, and and so. I think it succeeds there, but it just like shoots itself in the foot in a very like uh, grotesque way with these really gazy kind of shots. I mean, I don't know. You, film school nowadays, you're supposed you're taught not to do stuff like this. So uh, I mean, the last those thing specific I'll just, shots. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, just the last one I would raise is when Adele is in the shower at the end of the film. Yeah. Like, uh, and it it starts it starts down below her and then follows her upper body and and i just don't i don't agree that this is a reflection of her character i don't think that there's evidence in these moments that this is needed because this is getting us closer to adele's mind state like I put just, the camera I, in front of her face go go like shoulders up only let us see her consternation does that change the or, meaning of the shot i don't i think it changes nothing of what we get from the shot I also don't also just have her be topless in the shot. That's fine. Yeah. I uh, this you can is, imply it's nudity. A, it's fine. Implied nudity. Or literally counts. show it. Yeah, you can you can show it too. But just like I'm that, not even yeah. That like shot the point was I'm making, gratuitous. It's about the camera work. It's like have yeah. her have her have a full frontal shot of her in the shower contemplating. I think that's a more effective and meaningful shot than what we got. So this is where the, um, I said this already, but like the deep complexity of my thoughts on this come in because you guys were raising all these points and I was like, oh, I agree. Oh, uh, no, I disagree there. So here's my thing. <laughs> let's break it down. <laughs> so let's break it down. So I'm not going to come at this with a puritanical mindset. And I don't think any of us are that like this movie shouldn't have sex scenes. This movie shouldn't have, uh, you know, nudity in it at all. Of course, I don't think any of us are saying that. I think no. the movie falls um, apart without those elements. And, and, uh, I just said it should be more like Love's Lives Bleed. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are integral to the story. And if Lizzie was way more muscular. <laughs> they, are, they are integral to the story in that, you know, we need to see you, if you're making this movie about a, a very intimate relationship and a young woman coming into her sexuality, you do need to include sex scenes to a certain extent. Um, and, and so that from that standpoint, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I, I, th I think that, you know, including abstractly scenes like this are, are are is fine and also i do think there are some you know non-literal sex scenes like the one where uh, adele imagines her first sexual encounter with mm. emma that i think is done quite well actually yes, sure. um mostly because it's done is it, 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 you know with some sparing time in mind and yeah. not you know basically doing a super cut of 10 different sex positions 15 uh, seconds versus like seven or eight minutes exactly <laughs> And so that's the main delineation in my mind. I think that it is gratuitous it is a great word there. Um, you effectively can have those moments where, yes, ideally they would be, you know, shot with some more, shot with less male gaze in mind. Is that possible for this director who is seemingly a really shitty dude? I don't know. <laughs> Um, but you know, and, and also cutting down the time of them, it's it's the length of these sequences yeah, that absolutely. I think for uh, many people are drawing this conclusion of this is gratuitous, this is you're fetishizing this. Um, I went out of my way to look look for some reactions from female critics, lesbian critics, things like that, uh, and what I actually ended up digging up was comments at the time from the author of the original graphic novel, hmm. Jules Moreau. Um, what they had said is that they were in the theater watching this and they heard laughs. Yeah. And which yeah. is just harkening back to what Tucker had no, kind definitely. of mentioned. Yeah. Um, laughs from, and they, they kind of broke this down, laughs from uh, heteronormative people who don't understand it and are sort of alienated from this. 
laughs from people in the queer community who see how ridiculous it is that this is going on this long and yeah. like it's not intimate at all it's not romantic at all and then they also note you know the um perhaps the lack of laughs from men in the audience who are seeing their fantasy put on screen in front sure. of them yeah because you can imagine that like the director's not laughing <laughs> yeah exactly um so yeah Drooling, so, so that's the yeah, yes um so that that's that's that for me in that perspective on the front of it being you know this age gap under you know underage she's 15 i believe emma is supposed she's to not be 15. she's 17 15 is the age of consent that's no i think i i think i, I, I yeah, think she's, she's a junior she... in high school that's how we know for oh sure. she's 17 she, she has her 18 i think she might have been 15 in the graphic novel sorry I'm oh okay okay sure. um and so the age might age might be different for emma as well but i think in the graphic yeah. novel emma's supposed to be 22 i don't know if we ever get an explicit age from her so. she's in her she's in her fourth year of college so she's probably 22 sure yeah, that's me. Yeah. Um, so, so you have this age gap relationship, and that is obviously something that a lot of people have drawn issue with as well. Now, yeah. that is in the original graphic novel. That is in the original text. That is not something that Kashish himself uh, added to the film. And, you know, there is a lot of conversation around this. You bring up, like, Call Me By Your Name is, a, is another notable example, also marred by the uh, actions of Army Hammer. <laughs> um, yep. And so no, I, think, trying... I think there's a lot May, of like, December, we're watching out licorice pizza, yeah, we're watching out. Exactly. <laughs> so there's a lot of like there's a lot of like mixing that can happen uh, with people's feelings on this, you know, the, the real life uh, behaviors behind this and then the the text of the, the film or the graphic novel or what have you. And this is I know I'm, I know I'm rambling for a long time. Okay. I'm sorry. It's a point. Uh, um, Welcome to Quest, baby. Yeah. So. <laughs> this is Quest. Get your sensitive ass back to other. I movies. don't have an issue with. The, the age gap story. No, I think that, that, that is perfect. You know, it's fine. It is obviously, you know, I, I invoked Call Me By Your Name, sort of integral, not integral, sort of um, a recurring factor in telling queer coming of age stories, especially when they're, uh, mm -hmm. you know, have a romantic interest involved. Um, because, you know, as many queer people have noted that like, yeah, these age gap relationships can emerge in some cases because you're talking to you're you're sort of coming out of the closet, coming into yourself, figuring out who you are, and you might latch on to someone who is more mature, who has gone through those things already. Um, and when you're you know sort of marginalized by society, you have to like kind of find people who will guide you, no matter what their age might be. Mm -hmm. And so yes, and they can have obviously bear out in unfortunate ways, like it does in Blue is the Warmest Color. Um, and I want to get to like the specific arc that Adele has, because I do think she has a very clear and compelling arc, as does uh, uh, Emma for that matter. But I'll, I'll stop talking. I'll let someone else jump in for now. But that's just kind of like my general feelings on the underage aspect of this. And then, you know, obviously going back to uh, these sex scenes that we were talking about initially. Yeah. Let's talk about that character mm -hmm. arc because okay. I'm I'm like, I'm a little so, bit yeah. too old. I'm a little bit too old to think that like people with an age gap relationship should be thrown in prison or, <laughs> sure. or yeah. whatever okay. yeah. or whatever the Gen well, Alpha talking too, point is. A little too is. old, not online, not online quite yeah. enough. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a thing? That, oh, yeah. oh, yes. It's right. a yes. huge factor of discourse in real life, mm -hmm. in media, in everything. But the, the reason... I'm not online at all. Yeah. <laughs> the reason I draw particular attention to it is because regardless of what of the context you're bringing in, Tanner, yeah. there is an intrinsic power imbalance in a lot of yeah. different ways in a relationship that forms like this. Yeah. Um, and we know that they are in different positions in their life, not only in terms of age, not only in terms of interest, but also in terms of how their families accept them, their friends accept mm -hmm. them, the communities they walk yeah, in. Yeah. And I feel like this film, whether it's in the original graphic novel or not, I don't know, I've not read the graphic that's, novel. Yeah, that's... Th this story, to me, I think doesn't do a good job interrogating that disparity. Mm. I think we have interesting scenes that highlight it. Uh, for instance, when we go to have dinner at Emma's house, Opposed yeah, yeah. to having dinner with the Bolognese at, King. That's right. Yeah. Opposed <laughs> having dinner at Adele's house, where we learn that Adele brought Emma here under a pretense that she's her tutor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there is scenes like this, but then I find myself wanting after that time gap for the, there to be some sort of interest on behalf of the script to figure out what this relationship meant to. Adele in a more concrete way mm. because I don't feel like it really does. I feel like we basically mm. watch Adele spiral into this sort of depression 
and we don't spend the time with this affair she's having um, in any That's sort of <laughs> way that makes it clear how she's feeling. We learn a lot about her through sort of absence. So we learn about her a lot through this prism of what Emma wants her to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that there is this really awkward sense in the second half of the film that the fil that the filmmaking is siding with with Emma's actions being at minimum fine. Hmm. Uh, what? You know, I I don't think that Emma is ever. I don't think that the film because uh, I had this conclusion last night. Yeah. I don't think the film ever actually like takes a side necessarily. Like it's not it's not condemning yeah. the actions necessarily of Emma, but it's sort of saying that you know you can draw you can draw your own conclusions as as an audience member, and I think I, I obviously do. Like obviously, uh, obviously Emma hits her, which is which is not yeah. okay. Um, and also a factor in the sort of production history of this that that's one of the factors that uh, Leah Sedu brought out is that uh, Kashish apparently had them redo the hit like dozens upon dozens Ooh, of time in a row. Um, so yeah, th 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 that's an aspect of it as well. But for the story of the film, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think you could definitely draw conclusions that this age gap relationship is leaving Adele stunted in a certain way. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely the a word I would use is she's not. She was sort of uh, taken on this path by Emma, but she is not allowed to grow on her own. She's very much operating in the shadow, essentially, of Emma as yeah. like a uh, as a figure, as a person. And yeah, I think that I think it's really important. That's something that the film is really trying to note. And to, to be me, clear, I'm not. Oh, I'm, go ahead, I'm just trying. I'm not trying to make a moral judgment sure. on the character of Emma. Gotcha. What, yeah. what I'm trying to illustrate is I just don't understand what we're supposed to make of the fact that in the mm. second half of the film we have this implicit relationship between, or implicit uh, affair between Emma and the character Lise, who she yeah. later goes on to start a family with. Yeah. That's happening implicitly and is not challenged by the film at all. Uh, and then we learn that Emma has such power over Adele mm -hmm. that Adele's affair, which also happens, aside from a couple sort of aside moments, mm -hmm. also happens entirely off screen. Yeah, that's right. Those are treated as two very, very completely different acts. And then we watch the career of Emma flourish while we watch the life of Adele basically circle this drain mm -hmm. of disappointment. Yeah. And I don't understand what that's supposed to be telling me. And to me, it suggests a general disinterest on behalf of the, the script and the director to inject a little bit more of, of energy into that second half of the movie. Mm -hmm. I think See, that the second half of the movie is in some ways better, but also less compelling. Mm -hmm. For me, the I read their relationship as, as a very carnal relationship because of this film's insistence on sex bodies, uh, the touch, this, the, the close up lens that this film takes the entire time makes it to be, makes me think that I am that, well, Adele is in the relationship because of the body exploration and the, this like entirely new world that is opened to her. And so I, I agree with you, Abram, that, the the exploration as to why this stuff happens later on isn't really there but the foundation of their relationship to me is it's like real life weak it's it's a, it's a weak foundation to the relationship in the world of the story which is our world and so to me I, I'm, I'm able to, it's friends, not our world but <laughs> That's good. Yeah. All right, guys. The, the, I'll like, be here all week. Uh -huh. Just the ways that it unfolds because of, at least my, if I'm going to take what I read it as truth, that because they're really, it is kind of <laughs> a codependent thing, or at least Adele is like a kind of attached at the hip here, and it as is very needing in the relationship, then that is kind of where we get the unraveling coming from. And I... It's like it's simplistic to me. It's it, it in a way that is true to life, I think, but it isn't like exploring anything in a new way. It is just kind of mm. taking a story of of relationships that if, you know, you ask 10 people in your life, like the likelihood that you find a story is pretty similar to this one is is there. Um and so just our progression of the relationship to me isn't all that special i guess i think that it doesn't say much it doesn't like go 
very many places and i'm i guess i'm kind of i'm also left questioning what we're supposed to think of adele's character towards the end and her 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 sadness but kind of acceptance of it also i think it's it's messy in a real life way but this is a movie so let's give me a little more concreteness yeah well my reading of this film's arcs and like the intention of what does this relationship mean to each of the characters what do they get out of it that kind of thing um because ultimately as a romance film i think this is the kind of movie that is intended for you to watch to learn something about relationships and the ways that people interact with one another this for me is less a film about the the carnal aspect i do i do totally think that that is a an element of the obsession that um that adele uh, grows over the course of the film and realizes that's something that she's kind of thinking about a lot. Um, but it's more about the the power dynamic um, between with the age gap and the person that has yet to form their identity that is still searching for their identity and the person that has found their identity and the way in which because uh, Adele finds Emma so early and so especially so early in her discovering her sexuality. And ostensibly, as she was like everything from her past life, we don't really see her spend almost any time with her other friends. We don't we see her go to school her. a couple of times. Her friends, yeah, that's suck. true. Yes, <laughs> um, we we don't see her do much uh, on her own out once she started that relationship with Emma. What the filmmaking, the editing, the the writing is telling me is that, and, and I think that this is supported by the fact that the second half of the film is much more about. Emma flourishing and Adele having a difficult time discovering herself in adulthood is that because she was not given the opportunity to discover herself for herself or by herself, uh, she was kind of taught all these things by someone else who had already discovered that identity. Emma knows what she wants to do. She's an artist. She has relationships. She She's had relationships. Um, she understands her sexuality. She's more confident. She's more out. Um, Adele never learns those things by herself and never builds her own self-confidence in what her identity is. She's kind of shaky in what she wants to do with her life mm -hmm. in terms of a, do a job. She is told many times by Emma that she sh has artistic talent, but she isn't quite sure if she wants to pursue that fully. And so what I see the film saying is that it is very important not to just let someone else lead you by the hand, but to discover your own identity on your own and be confident enough in your ability to fail and to learn to go out on, to go out on your own and, and learn things because the note that the film lead ends on is a, is a kind of a bittersweet moment but i think it's ultimately a hopeful moment in uh that it, the last moment of the film is adele leaving the uh art gallery party uh and walking off on her own down a street and this comes after and, and the moment where they met up going, again at the cafe. Not going with that guy that she Not going with, with someone else. Yeah. Exactly. Not going with anyone else. Um, and it comes after the moment where they met up, back up at the cafe after uh, like two or three year times. It's, it's unclear, but... I think mean, three years, yeah. yeah. We, we learned that Lisa's kid is three. Oh, yeah. yeah that's why I thought the number there. three. Yes. Oh. Um, after a really significant time skip, they have this moment where, uh, where they reconnect and it becomes very intense, but it it's kind of more of an emotional release than anything. Um, and I think what Adele ends up learning through that moment, through visiting the art gallery and interacting with some of those people that she hadn't seen in a long time, and trying having to like being forced through like these m m small social interactions, to, like explain, oh, what are you doing with your life? What is your relationship mm -hmm. with Emma right now? Have you been seeing anyone that she hasn't? That because she's been so obsessed with Emma and because that relationship started so early and she wasn't given a chance to explore herself for herself or by herself, that she needs to leave that behind. And she walks off down the road by herself. I mean, and I think that's a very compelling uh, uh, character arc. And the reason why I found her to be so sympathetic is that you can understand through the lens of, of a young person how easy it is to fall into this kind of trap of someone that is treating you nice and but you and you don't want to notice that the that you're becoming obsessed like these things are, are presented by this film is so easy to fall into and then her making that decision that 
she needs to move forward is where the film ends on. And I think that's I think that's a powerful moment for her. I um yeah, well go ahead, Abram. I just don't I don't read that at all the same way. And the reason I don't is because it's I don't view Adele as a character who is wayward in a, in a larger sense because we learn from one of her very first interactions with what's the name of the guy Tom Thomas the Thomas yeah with the Thomas briefly yeah. they have an exchange while they're having lunch and she's talking about the power of teachers mm -hmm. and we learn from within the first thirty minutes of the film that she has a deep belief in education that she has a deep desire to learn to study to teach yeah and throughout the entirety of the film that stays true mm -hmm. and she realizes her her personal ambition to be a teacher while she is still in that relationship mm -hmm. when the relationship ends with emma her her the rest of her life stays in place she is still she's been a teacher before she's yeah. a teacher after she has this relationship with these students she has a community of, of, of colleagues around her, one that she's ha even had an affair with. All of this stuff is established while she's still in this relationship with Emma. Yeah. I, there, uh, this is why I think that the lack of interrogation about the fundamental difference between them on a, on a sexual level, on a, on a relationship maturity level, is because if you were to take Emma out of the picture, you have a, you have a young professional woman in Adele. We we know that she has a she has the career she's been talking about for the entirety of the film. Yeah, I, I, I that is that is true in the fact that she has gotten this job. Yeah. But I don't think the film presents that as a concrete, stable thing at all because Emma is the only thing that matters to her. When we see her going to her job, she is her lost in thought. She's thinking about the fact that she's stressed about their relationship. She's not going out to hang out with anyone. She hasn't seen her family in a long time. Yeah, she has a job as a teacher, and she wanted that at the beginning, but she is not focused on that. She's not happy with that. It is just something that is happening while she is in this relationship with Emma, which is where her mind is at. She's mm -hmm. always thinking about ne next time going home and making sure that she's figuring things out with Emma. The The teacher thing is almost incidental, and I agree that uh, that it is something that is constant throughout her character, but I think it isn't until the she... Uh, um, leaves the relationship with Emma, and then we see her uh, spending more time with the children with, uh, as a teacher. It's more meaningful time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It becomes meaningful time, where before that, it was, she was, you know, more disheveled, and she was just, like, kind of, mm -hmm. like, going along with the claps in the background, and she was blowing off, like, coming up with reasons why she's not going out with the other teachers. Yeah, there, she has a community around her. She has time with the children. She... She doesn't have it her own house. She doesn't have friends. Like, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to have to say some four dreaded words here. I agree with Tucker. <laughs> that's <laughs> no, I'm dangerous. Just, that's yeah, dangerous. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm j just joking. But of course, yeah, I think, I mean, everything that you've been saying, Tucker, I 100% I agree with. I think that is absolutely the character arc that they that they lay out for her. And yeah, the differences are, uh, let's, let's say not, you know, they aren't, they aren't black and white in between uh, the times when uh, Adele is with Emma and the time where she has outside of that relationship, but the you know her having a profession doesn't mean like she is an entirely resolved person, um, and she isn't resolved even at the end of the film. But you yeah. you come to recognize the difference when she's in the relationship versus when she's not. Yeah. Um, I think that the key moment for that is this film does a lot of this uh, is the uh, is sort of, sort of these um these callbacks, these thematic or visual sort of motifs, wherein the very last moment of her teaching very much mirrors the opening of the film, mm. sort of this opening narration oh, of the teacher yeah. sort of walking her students through a poem, uh, for example. Uh, now, the, the one at the beginning of the film was far more complex because it's for high schoolers, and the <laughs> one at the end is for first graders. But I think that the, that, that rhythm is there, that, that, that rhyming is there nonetheless, and we are meant to take from that that she is coming into her own to a certain extent she is finding what is meaningful to her but it's just like the very seed of that i mean the very end of the film as Tucker yeah. pointed out already is her coming to realize that like emma's moved on and like i didn't really have anyone outside of emma absolutely and not. i yeah. need to figure that out yeah. and it's so i agree Tucker. it's absolutely a bittersweet moment as like mm -hmm. she recognizes what needs to happen but that is such a daunting task to build your personal life as someone who is probably like probably 22 23 24 yeah. at this point like 
she was uh, going back to what I said. She was so stunted by Emma's by that relationship with Emma for for the for the longest time. Not that that relationship with Emma was outwardly toxic. We can see the toxic outcomes, of course, but yeah. they did care for each other, Absolutely. and Emma totally helped her come to terms with her sexuality and sort of Emma. Here's the crazy thing: Emma sort of gives her the answer to her own problem for you know probably like halfway through the film. When they're discussing Sartre and the uh, the philosophical viewpoints there, and it's a little, it's a little heady. I mean, I, it's it's Murakami esque in my mind because it's like, okay, now let us now let us discuss Sartre for a little moment in the middle oh, of the sure. movie, and it's like it fits, but it's also like, and they do it at other times too with other philosophers. So I'm like, yeah. It's the it's it's, 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 it's she very well clearly saying. lays out the Sartre this lays out the philosophical ideal that it is existence before essence. There is no such thing as predestination. You you exist and then you have to build your personal, which is actually you know, the your, opposite. You of have what, to build the personal around that. I mean, to to make fun of the philosophy is also is a maybe total bullshit criticism because it actually does play sure. into the uh, the film well because the earlier poem at the beginning of or is it maybe at the beginning. There is one part where the teacher's like, "Now I want you to think about about predestiny or about about predeterminists," and and the context was in relationships. And I remember, mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, anytime you hear a character be like telling other characters think about something, and you're yeah, in mean, like the that's, philosophical that's realm, it's like tip. the filmmaker anytime. is telling you to think about this theme. Yes. And and, and little movie. Anytime there's a classroom in any movie or TV show, <laughs> just pay attention to what the teacher's saying. That's the, the that's a theme of the movie. Yeah. Here's why I don't. Here's why. Here's why I have trouble with still. I I I think that the film, in explicit action and dialogue, shows that the relationship that Adele has with Emma is obviously this omnipresent force in her life because, mm-hmm. of course, she came to adulthood with this yeah, woman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But in the relation, in their relationship, Adele does not approve. Or sorry, Emma does not approve the, the life that Adele is living. She mm-hmm. says you have this creative skill set that you're yeah. not yeah. you utilizing. Mm-hmm. You know, you, I want you to actually be happy. And you guys are right that a component of that is is Adele saying, um, "I'm happy when I'm with you," and and that illustrates the point you're saying that of the mindset she has to get out of. Yeah. But she is also not she is not sacrificing the teaching to pursue this creative thing that Emma wants for her. This is why I think this this her profession is more important than just a job. And the fact that she cheats on Emma, the fact that she rebukes Emma's ideal of how she should construct her own happiness does suggest that there is a, a person here. Mm-hmm, and, and I think the problem I have with the, with, with the second half of the film is that I, I think T- I think Timo is totally right that the relationship is totally based on sex, because when they when they meet back up in the cafe, the the whole sucking on the hand yes. having her finger her under the yeah. table i mean that that is an illustration of the fact that that is what the relationship is that is what adele tries to use to goad emma back into the relationship mm-hmm. with I, you want me to touch you i want to touch you you mm-hmm. know that th- that this is the dialogue yeah and i not only find that dialogue incongruous with some of the more very grounded moments of the film but i generally think that the film chooses to put this burden of the relationship on Adele to the detriment of what are clearly set up other pillars of her characterization without ever really going into what the burden is. We don't, you know, if we're talking about the idea that Adele as a character has to m- not mature too fast by being pulled forward by Emma, but find her own way in her mm-hmm. own people. Well then, why don't we see the relationship with her and her colleague? Why is this because fo- she does she doesn't care about it? But, she's so focused on Emma that she doesn't have the and, mental bandwidth to do that. But, sure, but also I think if the film is trying to illustrate that this is in some way a a a story about breaking out of this obsession, yeah, I think it is ineffective to not show the very clear and huge acts of that individualism that Adele it does demonstrate in the second half of the movie. No, absolutely absolutely she does, but I think that it's about breaking out of the obsession as the film is closing. And like literally like the last 15 minutes. I think that the time the second time jump to uh once Emma's established the family and 
uh, Adele has been a teacher for a long time and that kind of stuff, that when they meet back up at the cafe, that is when I really think the film starts to more heavily lean into she's dealing with this. Because before that point, I don't think it's about breaking out of that. I think it's about the dangers of that. And so I don't think that it's necessary. I'm not, not, not saying that there wouldn't be an equally compelling narrative where that was a large part of the script of the runtime of the narrative, but that the bulk of the runtime of this film is about being ingratiated in a relationship that... The, I, I agree with what Tara's saying. I don't think it is an abusive relationship. I think that they are supportive of one another, but it shows the way in which that uh, Adele has... <coughs> excuse me. Prevented herself from... <laughs> yeah, me, I'm, like, I'm just paying attention. Uh, prevented herself from... From exploring the rest of her the avenues of her life, because in the moments where she is still having this teacher job, even though that's not what Emma wants, it's much more about the fact that it's not an abusive relationship, but the fact that Emma doesn't want her to be doing that and wants her to explore this artistry, and she doesn't want that, shows that this is something that's still holding her back. She doesn't have a partner that is like, "I'm so proud of you for being a teacher. Pursue that. This is what is, you know, making you comfortable as yourself." There's there's a, there's pressure on that, um, and and with the uh, not showing of the um, the cheating that she does, uh, I think that that is indicative of the fact that she's not even really thinking about that. Like, of course, there's like the latent element of she's doing this because she feels lonely, because she's not sexually satisfied. But in the moments where we see her, uh, like thinking about the affair that she's having, and obviously the fight that uh, comes after the, uh, Emma realizes that this is happening it's much more of her like in this at least this is how I read that scene of like she's she's doing that without like real conscious thought like she's not doing this because she wants to break out of it but because she feel like she feels like she has no other option like it's just like a it's a struggle it's just she's like she's tensed up um and so yeah I, I I we could have seen that but I think that not showing that is an is a another way in which the film focuses more on the fact that she is boxed in by this yeah. relationship. Here, so, allow, so, me, yeah, yeah, allow I, me maybe oh. to think about... Allow me. Allow me, because I, right, here we go. I'm i going to... My angle, I think, Mom and Dad, you're both right. Um, I clearly <laughs> see what Tucker is saying, and I believe that everything about their arcs is in the movie. Um, but my, my kind of issue with it is is actually a performance issue and it's it's that Adele's um affect you have performance issues? Yeah. Well, all right. <laughs> the, the, that that her vibe essentially is largely unchanged throughout the entire film. It goes from yeah. a state of mild depression to a state of extreme depression and then back again. But like on the performance, I don't get a lot of information about what she's feeling how this is like really going. I think that I get a really similar face the whole movie. And and it's a subtle and realistic performance. But I I I'm kind of like on the second half, this like I guess from the hour 30 onwards, that I'm not sold on it. And it was this cause of the performance for me. Yeah. Sorry to share a, a scoff and a look in, <laughs> in your presence, Timo, but I, I mean, I, I think I, I think I speak for Tucker and Tucker and I, and perhaps Abram. I, I don't think you have any. Um, do you have any performance issues, Abram? <laughs> <laughs> Admit it, live on Quest. <laughs> it's actually sponsored by Bluetooth. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, no, I believe, like I found the the performances to to be extremely strong. You know, this is coming from Exocopolis, who is a very young performer at this point. She is eighteen at the time of filming. Um, and it's, it's really, really astounding. The, uh, the, like the face work that happens in this yeah, film. Absolutely. Um, I mean, a lot of that is borne out because this film perhaps a little, you know, I don't want to say it uses close-ups as a crutch. Um, because oh, I'm going to get into something... that. Oh, okay. I'm going to get <laughs> into these freaking, it, when you're done, let me hit this can of worms. There is, <laughs> there is an overbearance of close up in this film because I think, you know, uh, Kashish is trying to make it a very intimate affair between these two people and, you know, perhaps recognizes, hopefully recognizes the skill and ability of his two actresses here. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I think that the, that the acting, uh, the nonverbal stuff, especially 
is really, really out of this world for both Sedu and Exarchopolis. Yeah. And is really even more impressive with Exarchopolis because the movie is really on her shoulders. You know, yeah, the graphic absolutely. novel, as I understand, is kind of more split uh, in terms of uh, where it spends its time with, with either character. But this is a squarely Adele's movie. Mm -hmm. Totally. And that is what made me love this movie. I came out the gate with, with pretty hot and heavy praise saying, this is one of my favorite movies we've seen for this Palm d'Or mm -hmm. uh, list. And it's because I was surprised by knowing what I knew about this movie, about it being a lesbian relationship where one of them has blue hair. Let's be honest. That's what we knew about the movie. That's what going you can in. sort of discern from the poster. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, and and Leah Sidhu was the one that I was familiar with. Yeah. Leah Sidhu, one of my favorite actresses, one of my major um, film actress crushes. That's that's Tucker, the Tucker runs synesthetic. I do oh, not run synesthetic, oh, wow. but I'm jealous of whoever runs synesthetic. Um, and if I ran synesthetic. I would post many. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 maybe not good to invoke that and go into that way in this film where you know we're discussing yeah, 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 like yeah. the you know the sexual exploitation of the kids. It of wasn't the me. It wasn't me. I didn't bring it up. I was just continuing That's the conversation. True. You did not. Uh, in that, I thought that this was going to be a divided film mm. in terms of the screen time and the narrative importance and the uh, um, narrative weight given to both of the characters. And I'm surprised coming out the other end, being like. Yeah, Leah Sadu was in this movie, and she was she, she did great. I think she gave a good performance. I, I think the character of Emma is 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 compelling. Um, but I almost don't care because yeah. it's only about Adele. Yeah, like it is about the emotions that she's going through and the thought process and the the struggles that she has as as a young person and the social interactions that make her feel different ways. I love this movie not because I love close ups. But because this movie loves close-ups on one of the best performances I've ever seen in my life. Uh, yeah, I mean, re regardless of, you know, my my issues with the film, I will say that this is, you know, sort of in line with Tucker, one of the best performances I've seen yeah. out of a Palme d'Or winner that we've watched so far in this series. Yeah. And, you know, just sort of uh, at all, one of, the, one of the better performances I think I've ever seen out of, yeah. of Exarchopolis. And it's, it's really, really, really fucking good. And sort of ranges like these... Uh, it navigates a very subtle sort of range of what she is experiencing because there's never a moment where she lays down on her therapist's couch and, and lays these things out. She mm -hmm. almost doesn't tell her emotions to anyone for exactly. the entire Exactly, that's my thing. But you, which is the problem. Yeah, which Talk is the problem. Talk to people about your feelings. <laughs> But you, they, they, are, they are clear to the audience, the viewer, nonetheless. And Absolutely. I think that is 100% uh, from the performers and their raw, natural ability. It's the performance and the fact that it's almost all close-ups. Exactly. In, in that we get her reaction to basically everything. Yep. Uh, and focusing in on her face, and even in the moments, in a lot, a lot of moments where she's not saying anything, it's, I can see the buttons being pressed in her head of, ooh, I'm... I'm not pleased by that, but I need to put on a little bit of a face to make it seem like I'm not upset by this. And the the thought process of her like, you know, sitting on a bench or laying in her bed or you know, sitting by a window and just like thinking about what happened in the in the uh preceding scene. I I I love this movie because I found the character interesting, but I found the character interesting. She's not like on face value, she's just an average person. She's going through her yeah. life, she's trying to find out who she is. She's not in some crazy scenario. She's not, she doesn't work on an oil rig, isn't Deepwater Horizon. Uh, but... Uh, it's a, Adele X Arcopolis in Deepwater Horizon. Hey, now, that's a, now that's a... Now no, that, that's a, that's a, a pitch. Yeah. Um, I, I, sh I shouldn't be as invested in this character as I would be on paper. Um, young French woman discovers her sexuality is really what this film is at its like most basic note. Um, there's no uh, extra cr crazy extenuating factors. But because... And Alex Arcopoulos imbues this character with every ounce of humanity I've ever seen in a performance. And it's so realistic. And it's so much about little, the little half smiles that she does when yeah. she thinks of something kind of funny. Or the the way that her eyes like look around. She does so many just like slowly moving her eyes around the environment. And I could watch a six-hour cut of this movie. <laughs> well, that is just... Her, her facial reaction is the thing. Talk because, yeah. the, it, I, I, honestly, it's one of the most intoxicating things I've seen on, on film. What about an 800-hour cut? 
800? No, that, that, that is apparently how many hours of footage that they shot for this film. Jesus. Um, well, I mean, that would be a lot of repeated scenes because if, I'm yeah, sure they well, retook the, you know, yeah. they had to take the scenes a lot of times. So, um, ah. <laughs> may speak to the sort of reaction that uh, Sedu and Exarchopolis had with the film that, you know, the very, it's the very grueling process. I was reading through it. It was scheduled to be like a two and a half month shoot and ended up going for five months. Ooh, five so, months. Oh, my God. That's yeah. a long time. That's like six um, days a week, five months. Not yeah, not your it, chill three day week. Yeah, and so per, perhaps I, I made a, I made a faux pas there, a uh, little well, French. Uh, oh, well, talking hey. talking about pr- production stuff, but I did want to uh, hit on one sort of Wait, one, one let more. Me, I got to talk about these close ups. Let's, let's go production. Because Let's the, go production. These close ups fucking piss me off so much. We never get to see a medium shot. There is not one no, medium shot not. in this movie. And that, <laughs> I mentioned it's, that too. It, it's close-ups or wide, is what know, you get. I know, yeah. and that that is like, it's a clear artistic choice that flops on its head in my, in my mind because it doesn't allow us to see our characters fully. We don't actually sure. ever get a chance to like understand who they are or how they're situated a lot of the times because that's because they don't understand themselves fully. Uh, uh, one of them does. Uh, one of them does understand who they are. But the that's movie's true. not about her. It's not through her eyes. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. The, the, it's just like aggravating as a viewer to me to never ever get this little bit of extra information. I don't, I'm not arguing that you do the whole movie in a medium, but I'm just like, you just no, use not. the medium at the beginning of the scene and then let us dive in. I think it's too intense to be constantly, constantly hitting you with this like, you know, never, you don't even get a full head most of the time in these shots. It's just so <laughs> freaking tight. And like yeah. that doesn't give away enough information. It doesn't let us know how the characters are sitting towards each other. We only get these little hints, which I guess is the level that this film operates on. But the I really, really desired a little bit more variedness from our camera work and a, sure. at, at least some different focal lengths. But we just I would, I don't know. We just don't get that. <laughs> a lot of shallow depth of field in this movie. <laughs> That's yeah. That's and it's job. just aggravating for me. I don't. I really I really dislike that creative choice, honestly. Yeah, Abram. Yeah, I'm kind of reminded a lot of Kenneth Branagh's Thor when I watch this movie. <laughs> Where there's a shot and they stick with it. <laughs> by the way, what he's referencing is Thor, directed by Kenneth Branagh, has heavy overuse of of uh, Dutch of Dutch, Dutch angles. angles. Yeah, <laughs> almost every shot for absolutely no reason. Like, and you're like, bruh, bruh, why? <laughs> I think part of the reason that I find bruh, bruh. the the drama of this film largely sort of. Um, uh, unmotivating it's a aside from key sequences uh is because the effect of this clo- of this close up shot and it's usually sometimes it's handheld and we will we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll, we'll tilt a little bit in the frame or something the effect of that is to make us uncomfortable as viewers we're too close to this person they're framed in this way huh. it's kind of awkward like you basically viewer, never experience a shot like that in your own vision in real life like you have to be so close yeah. to someone to like it's kind of like that very, very intimate what's going on right here oh boy <laughs> my, my heart's a flutter <laughs> and i think that, that's exactly right Timo. We, we're always looking through this one lens and when we're always looking through this lens the effect of it on me as a viewer becomes less and less sure. as the film yeah, progresses yeah. the, the lack of stylistic it's like variance. shooting heroin every day what? Um, exactly. Well, that says mundo type of boy. <laughs> well, here's the it's difference. It's less effective every time. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. Well, heroin. Isn't that how drugs work? Yeah, well, yeah. usually people I don't know. take heroin by like the fifth day. Like, ah, I'm over it. It's not. It's not. Doing <laughs> usually it for by anymore. the fifth day, they both quit. I I think that that is just not effective to me. I think when you're operating in one mode so often, sure. you you dilute the punch of your of your technique. Um, sure. It's the same thing with Rebel Moon in the in the in the, the shallow focus. Focus. Oh, shallow, shallow but, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, There's yeah. one visual motif and thematic element in this movie that really, really, really fucking irritates me. Okay, let's hear it. <laughs> and that is the, I think, sort of sophomore, like like, like freshman year f- philosophy level relationship between food and sex in the movie. Oh sure, yeah. I mean that's yeah. And and I find the sloppy eating. <laughs> Oh yeah, that that is prevalent in every sequence. That is supposed to feel intimate to just get tiring. Mm, okay, you want to know the Oscar truth? Yeah, didn't even realize I was a part of this film. 
the like, food and sex or the uh, sloppy eating? The sloppy eating. I was like, oh I god, never, never even, time never I even considered it. I was like, oh, this full, all oh, the upcoming Foley sequence. Oh, <laughs> I was like, not looking uh, forward to it when uh, I could uh, tell uh, it was gonna. Start. I, I honestly, I genuinely don't even remember. It. Here's a great example. <laughs> I guess, of it. In hindsight, yeah, I, I see, I, I see what you mean, but yeah, I'm I, saying I, Tom I, Jones. I'm, I'm, yeah, well, yeah, boy, uh, I, I'm more in line with Tucker there. It's like it, it, it didn't like didn't like get to me I, you know uh, as someone who who doesn't like you know loud uh, open mouth chewing by any means but uh, here's a great example okay after she breaks up with thomas she's yeah. lying on her bed and yeah. she, she pulls oh. out what what every person should have which is a box of candy next yeah. to their bed exactly and she eats Probably a candy just. bar and we're looking first of all we're, we're looking from the bottom of her boobs up to the top of her nose yeah, right. again let's just note this let's just note how the shot is framed yeah. right and you're seeing her mouth like this, and you're seeing her chew a candy bar. Yeah. And this is I do remember that. And this is a dire this is a direction that she's been given. Yeah. yeah. I promise you that if you had a hundred hours of camera footage of, of or eight hundred eight hundred hours of this woman living her life, she's not chewing like that except when somebody else go. Yeah. <laughs> And, and sure. my problem with this is you look at a film like Tampopo, which right. is a great film a great movie. that is that's all a better movie. Yeah, I think I, we'd all agree with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's that it is treating food uh, both sometimes literally and uh -huh. sometimes figuratively in a very sensual manner. Right. And th and then the link between food and sex and, and pleasure is played out with interesting visuals and there's a yeah. little bit more to dive into. Mm -hmm. But when I think you're keeping me in this odd close for so much of the movie and I'm watching somebody sloppily eat spaghetti and we're drawing attention to mm -hmm. the sauce on her lip, on everybody's lips and the napkin wipes and the open mouths, yep. I just think... I get it. Uh, and I think that's sort of my problem with sure. this film on a, on a large level, on a way so we're talking about how it looks. I get it. And I, and I, I, tr I, I feel similarly what, what about the large... What it's trying to say, I get yeah. it. Like, I, I didn't think that this film was super complex in its... Well, I think it's complex in its delivery, but it, in, it, in its message, it's actually very simple. Uh, and I... Well, uh, see, here, here's my thing. I think the film is trying to be subtle about its food and sex thing. They, the characters say it. The yeah. characters like have a little like jokey moment where they're like, "Oh yeah, I know, don't you like oysters?" But the like, oh, yeah, oysters, the oysters thing, yeah, yeah. like the the oysters conversation they have in the park is very clearly them in the film it, as two people drawing the connection for themselves between oysters and genitalia. Yes. Yeah, I and guess... we were both thinking like, really? I'm not sure about that. But <laughs> hey, listen, I've never been to France. I've never been to France. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that off camera. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I. I'll be after. I guess, I guess you take this shit. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> my <laughs> my problem is that the movie is too long to do this. Okay, that that's my thing. And I also I question the runtime in general. I was, I was talking to my friend about this movie. I asked her right. if she had seen it. She's seen it a couple times. She says she she hates Thanks. it less every time she watches it. Okay, but that's sort of you know that's it's a, a matter, sliding scale. It's a yeah. matter of degrees. Yeah, she described it as French people talking about philosophy. Overly long sex scene. Yeah. French people talking about philosophy. Overly long sex scene. Yes, and I do think there's an argument to be made for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just think there's an what argument exactly? to be made for this film being shorter because sure, I, I I don't know what I'm supposed to really get from the beginning of it. I think uh. that this is a film that's not super compelling until we meet Emma. Sure, well, uh, I I agree, and I think that's actually an important thing though uh, because. She doesn't have, feel anything interesting in her life until she meets Emma. Yeah, it's very I mean, much going through the motions, and I do think it's it's mildly interesting. Her like having a date for the first time and going to a movie and realizing she's not into this guy. That's fine. It's not like the greatest thing ever. I, but the movie's not interesting until Emma. Should I do have to point out that that that, that criticism essentially boils down to this movie isn't interesting until the inciting incident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's not fair. That's not that's not fair. I'm an audience member and I'm watching a three-hour movie. Yeah, and, and when we're spending the first. Half an hour, forty minutes, becoming ingratiated into. I don't think it's that long. Well, I can, I'll go back and I check. Think I, it was, I, 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 I probably I don't think remember. It was but but the point I'm making, time was that an issue for me to, to be blatant. The know. point I'm making is that we spend the film at the beginning very slowly getting ourselves into this bus routine, yeah. getting ourselves into this friend group, yeah. getting ourselves into these dinner routines yeah. of the family, and then the film discards all of that. And I and I understand that. This is about people across their life and things are going to change and we're going to visit them after time jumps and friends won't be the same. And the director's a psychopath who shot 800 hours of footage. <laughs> exactly. But I just think we spend so long 
with this friend group, we spend a long time setting up this deep, deep, deep homophobia. Uh -huh. And then we just sort of snap our fingers. That goes and goes basically nowhere to me, except well, for an internal kind you know, of you know what character. I think drive. we're on the same page. Okay. I mean, to me, honestly, it's like yeah. the characters are so vitriolic against her, even though yeah, one of the one scene, oh, <laughs> oh, Jesus, yeah, which is I think that's the best. My favorite scene in the movie, just the way that that mo whole the situation. Ellis. What the fuck? Yeah, well, because it's Ew, very, Timo. very what? I'm just we're that's making jokes that you're homophobic. Yeah. Oh, it's just so jokes. that scene. Um are we supposed to, you know, learn about Adele's internalizing this homophobia? Is she supposed to then, you know, what does she think about going to the Pride Parade? How does that matter to her? Is this world accepting of gay people or is it not? Like none of those questions are answered and they don't matter. I will say, let me precog. <laughs> okay, here we say, go. You're here we going go. to raise the point here we that go. when she is lying to Le Leah Sedu at towards the end of the film, yeah. she has she gives a fake address where she's being dropped off. Uh huh. I, and what, huh? And yeah. But, Wait, why was I going to bring that up? Because I in, didn't even. I didn't remember that, that moment. In that dialogue, uh, Adele talks about how you know people are going to ask questions about me living with a woman, and I don't want to yeah. address it. And there is no doubt these these threads about Adele's upbringing yeah. that yes. are present through the, the entire movie. And she has definitely internalized a very heteronormative view of the world. Yeah, totally. um, we see that with, we, we, we know that her father is very traditional. You yep. can't make money in art. You got to go get a real job. Hey, it go, go, goes back to the, um, the old, what we were talking about. I was like, hey, her, her teaching career yeah. is that. Like, that's... Again, that's not uh, Emma having that imprint on her. That's her father leaving that imprint on her. That maybe she does want to pr pursue literature, but she has to get a normal job. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, we don't we don't ever even see her write. There's no scene of yeah. her writing because she says she writes write in my journal. Yeah. Emma talks about that as something she's really good at, but we never see a private moment no, when when uh, when when Adele's opining how much she loves to write and she she wishes she could do it more. Uh -huh. There are these, there's this internalized, heteronormative, traditional mindset that does inform Adele's character. But I do agree with Timo that even though there are these moments that do expose that, it's not in any way pertinent to the relationship she, she, he has, she has with Emma. Well, and I don't think that these, these very openly queer communities and spaces she's in are, are informed by her upbringing. And I don't think the film even attempts to square her 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 shame for her identity with her new life in an openly queer space. No, I here's here's the important thing because I don't think that she I don't think that she is inherently shameful of it. She is worried about no, what other people so. will think. She's what you know. Her, we yeah, see sure that's a good point. Her friends being intensely cruel to her. We get the just like basically the vibe from the the King of Bolognese, her father, <laughs> um, that that he would not approve of this. And I think that, that that's the thing that I was talking about with the with these uh, the the recurrent age gap uh, trope in in queer coming of age stories that like the older person sort of takes them under their wing and guides them into communities where they where they won't be shunned or insulted because of these things because of because of their sexuality and so yeah I I don't necessarily think that you know uh, Adele has internalized this by any means I don't think that's an, really an element of the film I think it's more a matter of Emma taking her to, you know, bringing her to her friend groups and being yeah. like, <coughs> See, whoa. <coughs> whoa, this wall's and spit there. Uh, just, and taking her to these friend groups and saying, listen, these people aren't going to shout at you on a street curb yeah. or whatever. They're, they, they're accepting of me. They'll be accepting of you. Yeah. So what I really wanted to respond to was the length and the repetition and the mon mundanity of the opening section of the film. I'll be generous and say it's 35 minutes, okay? All right. We're all, we're all the same page. Yeah. Uh, is that, yeah, it's not, a lot of that's not prevalent. The friend group disappears. The the friend that she has that uh, that takes her to the gay club, he's not, he doesn't show up again. Mm -hmm. uh, her her parents are barely, if at all, seen in the second, to like two thirds of this movie. Yeah. I, I think that's all accurate. But again, I think this is all where I read the effort and the intention of this film is that she leaves behind basically her entire life. When she meets Emma, we see the crossover of those things. They have dinner with their family. She there's the whole homophobia fight on the on the, on the street street corner. There are these moments where the worlds are colliding, and that's where the tension is at. It's most between the two aspects of her life. Um, but the fact that we that she uh, we, we we leave the bus thing, we leave the friend group, we leave the parents, all of that behind, 
even the homophobia part, uh, especially after the time skip, mm -hmm. it's like all of that's gone. It's because she she left all that behind, yeah, and I all mean, that yeah. matters to her is, and all that she's focused on, all that she's obsessed about is the relationship with Emma. Uh, and Emma has moved her to a different part of the city or a different city, and and she uh, and she has a whole new friend group. You know, she, we don't really think she, I don't really think she has any friends, so but you, uh, there's yeah. there are people around her. It's a different group of peers. Um, you know, Emma drives her around. Like yep. the, all of that is abandoned, and it. it it's, I think it's supposed to feel weird that all that is gone, but it's again, it's just uh, the film telling me that she's now focused entirely on Emma. She's left all this behind. The, the homophobia, the friend group, the parents, the bus routine. Yeah, we saw that at the beginning. That's where her life was before. It's not that now. So, to, thank you for bringing up the uh, the new friend group because I think this is uh, an important element of of uh, Adele's character arc as well. Is that you know she never feels at home no. or like but you, she, she never feels you know welcomed into or you know comfortable around them because they are these artsy people who are always yeah. discussing art and artists and all these things and they're um, all older than her uh sure. and she never got the chance to learn about these sort of things yeah because she her growth is stunted by the relationship <laughs> yes um and you know her, her point of reference which is a, sort of the joke at the beginning and then when it ha when it occurs again later is sort of a little bit sad is her only point of reference for for artistry is Picasso yeah, yeah, yeah and like you're like you're you're you've been dating an artist for years and years she hasn't like looped you into any other different artists or anything yeah. like that like it's an interest that you guys presumably share and I think that is a matter of for Emma and this gets that back to our, our conversation about like hey is Emma like a you know in, in ascribing moral worth to her or whatever but you know is Emma like in the wrong in anything she's doing. Well, what, what sort of light does the film paint Emma in? Um, I think Emma, you know, sort of um, subtly, but I think clearly, is objectifying Adele in a certain way. Uh, sort of treating her as this younger person that she can sort of guide and mold yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but also, after that time jump, we really see that Adele is a muse for Emma yeah. more than anything. And she that's the, the only way that Emma is interested in her. Exactly. She yeah. is the subject yeah. of all these paintings hanging up in their house. Um, she is the subject of a lot of paintings <laughs> that are being discussed by these art dealers and everything like that. And you come to find out that that's kind of like the worth of Adele to Emma after all these years. And it's pretty, pretty you know, sort of sad to see Adele try to exist in that role. Yeah, totally. um, especially in the community that she, that, that, uh, that um, Emma has, can, has formed now. Like, when she's, I think one of my favorite moments from Adele Exarchopoulos' performance is when she's serving the Bolognese again to mm -hmm. her, uh, to her wealthy and art artistic friends. Yeah, she's the princess of Bolognese. Yeah, she's the princess bolognese but like when she's when she's serving it up she's like very she's very worried that like she this is like her thing like yeah. this is the only thing that she can do and contribute to this party not to the conversation at yeah. all but like is everyone is everyone having enough food and stuff yeah. like that and then she looks up at the conversation happening you get a sense of like alienation and sadness on her face um and i also like to point out just a little reflecting film knowledge here a little bit <laughs> film that they're showing at the party is uh, G.W. Pabst's uh, Pandora's Box. Oh, no shit, which also Pandora's has, Box? I didn't even it's notice. Pandora's Box, I've actually which seen also has, uh, you know, Hayes Code uh, lesbian yeah, themes yeah, to it. Yeah. Yeah. Pandora's Box is a very interesting movie with a lot of Great layers film. to it. Love that one. <laughs> well, well, shall we give it a uh, Any other areas? Or, uh, yeah, that's fine. Hey, should we talk about the color blue in the film? Oh, yeah, I mean, it, it matters. It's, it, you know, it was, <laughs> it was the, you know, it's her color hair. And then when, when I was like, oh, my God, Leah Sidhu has no longer got blue hair. I was like, something is up. Something is lo is yeah. afoot here. Yeah, I did. And that's, I, 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 that's the at the point in the movie where their relationship obviously falls apart after that. Yeah, on the rocks, Ta yeah. time, get, time get. But I think it's also when uh, Emma is no longer really interested in um, yeah. in Adele and I think that, that is really why I find that second half of the movie so compelling and so heartbreaking for this character Adele that I, I, I enjoy and, and, and I, I love so much I'm like I want to see the best for her mm -hmm. um, is that almost every scene in that second half of the film is her like trying to get Emma's attention and just like you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be your, your new model I will I'll make food for your friends mm -hmm. I will uh, I'll, you know, I'll go down on you all this stuff and Emma's just not having any of it um and that's like it's an unrequited love that it is just like so frustrating it makes all those scenes so compelling especially when we're focused one of the best creative decisions of this film 
close up shots on a Dallas Acropolis. <laughs> um, one more thing I wanted to bring up, and sorry, this is probably a, a complex topic that we probably shouldn't just cr- shouldn't have just crammed in at the very end. But so I don't know if this will uh, invoke more conversation or not. Um, and I guess it's sort of th- cyclical in how we, in what we started this conversation with is you yeah. know the the male gaze of the uh, of you know Kashish putting the sex scenes in this film. Um, there's a conversation that happens at this party that we were just talking about towards like the, you know the two thirds part after immediately after that time jump, where a man I I think it's the art dealer uh, or the, like the art expo owner or whatever is talking about the recurrent element of men in art trying to recreate women's ecstasy yeah, is yeah. specifically a line that comes up. I'm like and failing at it. Yes, or just just being generally obsessed with it, yeah. and you know it being displayed in art of all mediums far more than like men's pleasure, for example, because men's pleasure is easy to understand, and men uh, male artists are obsessed with like trying to capture that and, and mystery and, and dilute it. Of the exactly. female orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> well, as uh, effectively, yes, that's what he's talking about. But we'll talk about that after the <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's that's what he'll be after dark. Um. Anyway, I just found it to be a really interesting line to bring up. Yeah. I want to know what your guys' thoughts on it are as like Kashish uh, being, you know, the writer for this film, you know, taking it, adapting it from this original graphic novel, putting that line in there, presumably, um, as like a comment on the film itself. Yeah. I, what are you guys' thoughts there? It's kind of... It... It's it's almost it's not like self defeating I think but it isn't it I don't think it's a particularly like great look on the film because it kind of points out of its own flaw, which yeah, totally. is you know is all right I thought it was an interesting uh, line of discussion during the film I uh, you know it's like okay so what we've seen here you know reminds reminding us that what we're seeing in the sex scenes are directed sex scenes and that we're not you know it's not real. Mm-hmm. I guess that's kind of the only thing that I could read out of it. That that perhaps this, you know, ecstasy of which there is only a little bit in this film. It's mostly it's not a lot of ecstasy in this movie. Uh, is not perhaps the the real deal. Does that mean that the sadness that we're ha- we're seeing is not the real deal either? I'm not sure. Well, it's all acting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a documentary. <laughs> uh, I found that line very intriguing. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, you know, they're like, oh, you're so sweet. Or hello, human resources yes, yes. meme. Yes. Yeah. The oh, you're so sweet is me watching the end of Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah. Hello, yeah. human resources is this <laughs> well, part I of think the movie. That, I think that it, in Killers of the, because that's the example I immediately thought of, too. It's the last time we kind of like brought something like this up on Quest is that that is like a man at the end of his career sort of reflexively go, looking back and being like. Well, this is the end of Kashi's career. <laughs> well, he did make some movies after this, to be clear, to be clear. <laughs> Functionally, um, functionally. Hey, banned. and Scorsese will make some movies after *Killers of the Flower Moon*. So, <laughs> fingers crossed. Um. Anyway, what was that? What was I saying? Uh. uh it, the difference. It, it it feels like to me, and blue is the warmest color, to be like more lamp shading more than anything else. Is like, yeah, here's the thing that we're doing, but also I'm doing it. Um. I don't know. It's 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 really tough to like parse like because you can't excuse it off of that line. It's not like. Hey, I said the thing I'm doing, so it's all right that I'm showing yeah, yeah. you ten minutes of you know uh, uh, effectively lesbian porn. You know, <laughs> I mean, let's just hope that the anti woke brigade doesn't find this episode of Quest because I'll let me just listen. Okay. The reality <laughs> oh, is, that it's a, it's a, it's a it's a male presence at this table of, a table of women speaking on behalf yeah. of the women yeah. and controlling the entire conversation. And I think that's really fucking ironic when you're making this movie. Well, I think the difference between yeah. Killers of the Flyer Moon yeah. and this yeah. is that Killers of the Flyer Moon is interrogating that idea. Yeah, this yeah. is that's explaining true. what the director it's is really, trying to achieve it's with his really pornography. Just, yeah, it's just a throwaway line that he th- that he uh, that he tosses in there. Um, yeah. I think y'all all sort of uh, mimic what the did I say the author the, the author of the original graphic you novel? You did say their name, yeah. Yeah. Let me let me let me double check that. Let me just I got I got You Pandora's, got Pandora's box Just put everybody at your score sheets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're about ready to give us we're doing it. We're getting it here. Um I will mimic what uh original writer of the graphic novel, Jules Moreau, said, which is that there was one thing lacking in, in the production of the uh, of this film. Lesbians. <laughs> Actual lesbians <laughs> Actual on set. Actual lesbians. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. 
Um, I can't. I, I also think of uh, something like uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire when, when we're talking about this and like you know lesbian uh, relationships on screen, a uh, male director versus female director. But. Yeah, Portrait of a Lady on Fire feels like such a supremely more successful film in what it's trying to go yes. for than this. Oh, one. 100%. Hey, even though I like this movie, I completely agree. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, I got a score. Okay. Are we ready, kids? Aye, aye, yes. Captain. Three, two, one. <laughs> Wait, wait, I attempted in a parentheses by accident. It's okay. We have a number. It is 6.4. And that gives oh, us a tie. tie. Yippee. We have to debate. This film, Blue is the Warmest Color versus Abbas Kurashtami's Taste of Cherry. Taste of Cherry. Never mind. What? Never mind. Okay. All right. No, I, I know. No, oh, 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 um, oh. I would go. I would go Taste of Cherry. I would go blue as warmest color. I think I think we're pretty clearly split yeah. on people who don't like this movie. It's 50-50. I think it is 50-50. Yeah. I like the it philosophical the discussion it does go to the audience. A, a lot more in Taste of Cherry. Yeah. We need to find a very specific type of person to deliberate this time. Somebody yeah. who's seen blue as the warmest color <laughs> and Taste of Cherry. Oh, think, oh boy. Reina, maybe? Oh, Nas, yeah, maybe. Steph, maybe. Steph, how do you, Stephanage? Is that how you pronounce it? Oh, Steven. 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 Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a username. <laughs> well, I didn't know his real name. Yeah. Steven. Oh, it's in the name. Hi, Steven. Hi, <laughs> Steven. So Steven. I think Steven probably seen both of these. So, so yeah, we will, need, we will need a tie break. We I assume, need it, a tie I assume break. you'd go Taste of Cherry. Timo, you go Taste of Cherry. Yeah. Yeah. So for oh, I would go blue as warmest color. Just, oh, but just for the record, yeah. Uh, for the twelfth spot on our list, cast your votes down below. I am hoping to see some proof of viewing these films from both from our from our voters. What does that even mean? Show your work. <laughs> Show, Show your, your work, work in the folks. comments that you actually watched both of these movies because I just uh -huh. generally don't believe that most of YouTube has. <laughs> Send yeah. us a a a. a mp4 file of yep. you sitting in front of your tv viewing each movie <laughs> in its entirety that's right an that's extreme right. close-up in honor an of extreme that's right yeah. <laughs> we need five hours of footage from you if you're gonna comment on the please please if that bar right. if that bar um, is too high just flip a coin and we won't know the difference um if the bar is too high lie it doesn't matter yeah. we need you to vote yeah um as palm, long as one person votes palm details folks hit us yeah. with them, hit us with them. All right. Well, in 2013, we had quite the killer's row at the Cannes Film Festival, both in terms of the jury and the other films in competition. So uh, the jury president this year was a little guy. You guys might have heard of him. I mean, it was Steven Spielberg. Oh, it was Steven know. Spielberg. Uh-huh. He was the jury president. Uh, serving on the jury with Mr. Spielberg was Ang Lee, Nicole Kidman, Christian Mungu, uh, Lynn, Lynn Ramsey and Christoph Waltz. Oh, wow. I actually recognize almost every single one of those names, yeah. and that is rare. Yeah. The director of the Hulk, Ang Lee. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, no, just Hulk. Just Hulk. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, star Probably of the AMC not. ads, Nicole Kidman. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other films in competition. There are twenty films in competition. Some notable ones were Steven Soderbergh's behind... Christoph Waltz, star of Elite Battle Angel. That's right. Yeah, yeah thank star you. Star of that um, movie. <laughs> Uh, Steve Soderbergh's Behind the Candelabra was in competition, as was James Gray's The Immigrant, Inside Lewin Davis from the Coen Brothers, Like Father, Like Son from Corey Ada, uh, Alexander Payne's Nebraska, Only God Forgives from Nicholas Winding Refn, mm -hmm. Only Lovers Left Alive from Jim Jarmusch, uh, a Takashi Miike film called Shield of Straw, and a Asghar Farhadi film called The Past. Mm, wow. I really hope we encounter a winning ref and move in with our review series. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really like to do that. Yes. The steam is going to be coming out of all of our ears if that happens, because I believe the strong opinions on, on ref and abound in this. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Wow. I'm is, steamless, I guess. Oh, Abe, Timo, did you say these scores that we've laid out as well? Oh, I didn't give the no, scores for that one. I forgot. Thank you well, for we're, we're pretty clearly split on this one. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. The scores are, Aim gave it a 4, I gave it a 4.5, Tanner gave it an 8.3, Tucker gave it an 8.7. So, pretty oh evenly split. Gives us a 6.4. Tip my fedora, my lady. <laughs> Tip my blue wig. Tip my blue wig. <laughs> All right. Madame. Um, yeah, we'll have, to, we'll have to go to the audience vote for that one. Unfortunately. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out where it falls next week. Yeah. Real. Help us out, please. It's a big call to action, too, because we don't have to get too much engagement, so we better... Mm. No. Well, maybe this one will be huge. Maybe this we'll one. Just, we'll, we'll just toss a question in the Discord if we don't get any responses. Yeah. We'll ask Synesthetic which one they like more. Yeah, <laughs> well, I feel like I have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> already. All right, Timo, 
Let's rock and roll. Wheel, wheel, what's your deal? Give us a movie that makes us squeal. Is it on digital or is it on real? Wheel, wheel, what's your deal? Oh, Let's and the number is here. nine, nine. Ooh, nine. that's an early one. Nine. That's, a, that's an old movie. I was hoping you were singing French to us. No, nine is Whoa. German. Tucker, you're, Tucker, you're back, in, back in the studio. Do you want to read this one out? I'm back in the studio, yeah. Uh, today's movie that is number nine uh, gives a movie never heard of in my entire life. I've seen it. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is a film directed by Alf Sjöberg. Starring Stig Jarl, oh, Alf Stig. Hjellen, uh -huh. Mai Zetterling, Olaf Winterstrand. This is Torment from 1944. Mm -hmm. okay. the, the logline reads, Jan Erik Wingren meets the lonely Bertha Olsen, mm. a woman struggling with alcoholism. Oh. Though Bertha is already linked to Caligula, Jan uh -huh. Erik's heartless teacher. She begins oh. a relationship with the boy anyway. <laughs> When, <laughs> when when Caligula learns that uh, Jan Eric is having an affair with Bertha, uh -huh. he begins to torture his student psychologically. Ah. He reserves his cruelest behavior for Bertha, however, mm. uh, which results in a tragic turn of events. Uh, I bet she dies. Do you know who wrote this well, movie? Spoilers. <laughs> what? Who wrote it? Yeah, someone we've heard of actually. Ingmar oh, Bergman. Ingmar Bergman. Oscar. No, he's the editor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ingmar Bergman, also the uh, assistant director on this one, apparently. Huh. Interesting role Victor for the writer. Victor Shellstrom. Yeah. You, Producer. You guys, you guys, yeah, the lines, good. they gotta be verbatim. The lines, they gotta oh, be verbatim. I've seen the Phantom Carriage, the carriage and yeah. he gets slapped. I've seen yeah. those. Okay. Those are good movies. Well, uh, Can I also ask the audience for one more thing? Yes. Can you tell me in the, in the audience, please tell me, why are the subtitles of movies sometimes different from the lines being spoken? Just answer oh, they, that for me. The ones we were watching were just bad. They yeah, the, bad there, was, there was just a couple misspelled words in there in ours, but I think it's probably just a translation thing. Yeah, no, I, I'm talking about even English. I'm talking about like bad boys oh, too oh, right oh, now. Oh, I get you. Okay, okay. This is a non sequitur, but please gotcha. answer that in the comments yeah, as well. It, well, it depends on where you're watching. Blue is the warmest color. I noticed a couple of times that my subtitles weren't really what the characters were saying because my. My limited grasp of French was telling me that they were saying something. It, it's kind of like in the uh, literal translation versus vibe translation. Is I guess how I mm. think about it. Sure. That uh, yeah. that uh, criterion channel rip that I found worked pretty well. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fellas. All boys. Thanks for talking about this movie. The All Boys cast gets together to discuss, discuss a film about lesbians, and you know yep. what? We survived. We came out the other end. That's just right. Fine. So. Next time. We did what? We came out the other We came out? Yep. Good oh. job, boys. Good job, Brian. Right. Next time, we're talking about Ingmar Bergman, <laughs> who wrote the film Boo. Torment from 1944. Boo. Thanks for this discussion. Keep it right here on Backlot Banter for all your favorite movie analysis and coverage. Until next week, you know what I say. Stay warm. Keep cool. Peace. Okay. We didn't, even, we didn't even bring up the themes of class. Fuck. Open balls. Well, she goes to class. That's true. Seems like class of that fucking stupid kid who can't spell onion. <laughs> <laughs>